like to talk to you for a minute about Jesus. <laughs> Have you taken him as your personal Lord and Savior? No? Then you're probably not in politics. You're equally American if you're a Hebrew, a Jew, or a Christian, or a Muslim. You're equally American if you choose not to have faith. Now, I know George Bush says Jesus Christ changed his heart, but believe me, Dick Cheney changed it back. There are people out there, hundreds of thousands of them, probably millions of them, who are praying for Bill Maher, and he probably, he probably thinks that's icky. Uh, people really believe in God in this country. We're a God-fearing country. Religion, it's a powerful healing force in a world torn apart. <laughs> by religion. I mean, the funny thing about this is, I'm calling liberals godless. Oh, they're cool with that. Just don't attack the Jersey girls. Well, isn't that special? We formed the moral majority. And we weren't intending to say that everyone else is of the immoral minority. Here's something you ought to say first thing when you wake up in the morning. Here's something you ought to say just before you go to sleep at night. Here's something we always say on the third Wednesday in April after the first full moon in spring at four o'clock when the bells ring. We are here to take a stand for our religious liberties and our religious freedoms. And they are under attack. I'm telling you that that's the only righteous message for this evil nation that has gone the way of the broke back mountain. God's wrath is upon this nation. No one is to stone anyone until I blow this whistle. Do you understand? No, I, I rather like this God fellow. It's very theatrical, you know. A pestilence here and a plague there. Omnipotence. Got to get me some of that. Guys, guys, guys. How are we supposed to have a conversation when everybody's talking at once? What's happening here? Why is the gospel of love dividing America? I think we make a mistake when we Never mind. Honest. Never mind. I'll find out for myself. I'm from the suburbs. My parents broke up shortly after the Beatles did, and I grew up the eldest of three in a single parent home where our TV got four channels and Pat Robertson's The 700 Club was always on one of them. As a teen, I went to an evangelical church, though I think we called it charismatic back then, and biblical prophecy was hotter than roller disco. The motion picture you are about to experience is fiction. The prophecy is not. I would rather have been scared into heaven than have to go through this. A Thief in the Night is coming from Mark IV Pictures in color. Please do not reveal the ending. Well-intentioned youth pastors spent the Carter administration scaring the hell out of us with this end-of-days cheese. Schlocky, but everyone knows religious thrillers are bulletproof. Ask the guys who've sold 65 million Left Behind books. Ask Dan Brown. Despite the healthy dose of fear-based Christianity, I found myself drawn to Jesus' gospel of love. I turned 16 and was baptized. But still, my church confused me. I don't remember hearing all that much about faith, hope, and love, but I knew the rapture was imminent. The Antichrist was John Paul II or Egypt's Anwar Sadat, but my money was always on that creepy little kid from the Omen. And in the spring of 1980, the Mark of the Beast appeared on Paul McCartney's new solo album. Now, I'd never seen this ominous looking marking before, and after listening to this soulless album, sorry, Paul, I naturally assumed that my favorite Beatle was in league with the devil. Now, it turns out this was just the introduction of the UPC barcode. You see it everywhere now, and so far, no one has tried to stamp it on my forehead. But when Antichrist frontrunner Anwar Sadat was assassinated, I thought the rapture was on. But the devil didn't show. Sadat stayed dead, and I blew a fuse. 
I guess somebody got it wrong. The world didn't end in 1984, or in 1988, or at Y2K. And that one still grinds me because I gave away third row seats to Springsteen. I know, I don't know what I was thinking. Well, 25 years later. Nice. I still believe. I still take my faith seriously. I attend an evangelical church most Sundays, but this collision of faith and culture in America is killing me. It's one thing to project our opinion from a bumper sticker. It's another to have a conversation. I'm afraid we're getting it wrong again. Jesus as a philosopher is wonderful. I, there's no greater role model, in my view, than Jesus Christ. It's just a shame that most of the people who follow him and call themselves Christians act nothing like him. Most of them? Most Christians most are in this country. Bad? Jesus said, before you look at the evil out there in the secular humanist, you'd better take a good look at the evil that is within your own lives. And I think it's time for the evangelical community to begin to say, what's wrong with us? Let's take a look at our own morality. Let's read through the Sermon on the Mount. That's a fair question. Let's look at what the red letters of Jesus are really all about in Scripture. If we're delivering a message that the people of America don't want to hear, so be it. As long as we're not delivering it in a way that they don't want to listen in the first place. Our evangelicalism how is perceived as we hate you as we hate you. So I think that uh, to that extent, we need to tone down. That someone that doesn't understand faith in Christ would run from us is completely understood by me. I completely get why they would do that. We got a world full of damage, you know? Stop telling me what I'm doing wrong. Tell me that there's a way out. And that's the heart. Even though I was a believer, uh, and, uh, and perhaps because I was a believer, I was cynical. Not about God, but about God's politics. Now it seems to me the separateness isn't getting any of us anywhere. So I set out across a nation divided to have a conversation with anybody willing to have one. Pagans and druids, stop dancing in the woods. Step away from the bonfire. I want to talk. Bible Belt Conservatives, do not fear me. I come in peace. Godless citizens of the West, drop your brewskis and chat with me. Intellectual elitists from the East, come down from your ivory towers and talk to this peasant. Gather round bumper sticker man, boys and girls, and pick out your favorite. The agnostic dyslexic insomniac that lies awake wondering if there really is a dog. <laughs> I mean, you've got a lot of hot potatoes here right now. What? Any particular favorites? Hey, we'll get to you in a hand. Hang on, Rudolph. We'll be right with you. I think the abortion, big people killing little people, is interesting. Well, I like God spoke and bang, it happened. And I think it fits nicely with, uh, with Darwin and a Jesus fish. What, what good do you think does it do for you to put uh, pro-American anti-Bush on your car? Oh, it's easier than rolling down my window and yelling at everybody. I come from a very religiously diverse family. My, bro my brother's Mormon, my grandpa's a Baptist pastor, my mom is Catholic, my dad is Buddhist, and I'm God. I can turn around for you too, I got some more back here, so complex ideas are getting reduced to uh, simple bumper sticker slogans and that seems good enough for lots of people I mean what, what are you what are you finding I find that I agree with you I'm happy to have a conversation with you as long as you agree with everything that I think well, that, that that's fair and that there's no conversation between the two extremes that are represented in your costume this huge juxtaposition where people aren't listening to each other and they're just arguing, they're railing their own faith, whether it's you know science or religion, and they're just butting heads and not listening to each other? I shouldn't say costume on your clothing, sir. <laughs> no, I'm not offended by costume, because see, we're having an open dialogue. You see, this is how we do it. It's a conversation. You let me know when you find one. Okay, so right there. So which one is he pointing to there, Jim? Hell out of my way. I'm late for church. Uh, my name's Dan, by the way. Uh, my name is, is Lou. Dan, good to meet you. <laughs> and with, great, with, with great hesitation, he gives me his real name. <laughs> From Southern Baptists to occasional Catholics to concerned atheists 
and apathetic Protestants. Everybody believes something. Everybody's got a dog in this fight. But what impression does America have of Christians? What are they known for? So to be holy, I guess. Forgiveness. Going to church. Fanaticism. Killing off of non-Christians. Well, Christians are known for the Crusades. <laughs> Historically warfare, but uh, we try to forget about that. Mm, trying to get other people to be Christian would be one answer I'm thinking of. <laughs> Being good people. Love thy neighbor type things. Mm. Compassion. Theatrics. Loving Jesus. Probably Jesus Christ. Being really snobby. Yeah, a lot of hypocrites. Hip being a hypocrite. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> trying to live the right life, trying to do the right thing. Appearing to be holy and being buck <laughs> while uh, behind closed doors. And that's a fact. Everywhere I traveled, I heard the same mixed reviews of Christians. I had an idea where these perceptions were coming from, but while in Philadelphia, I went to see Dr. Tony Campolo, noted author, professor, and red-letter Christian. Perhaps he could give me some perspective on this cultural divide. It's a quote from St. Augustine. It's a good quote. He said, the church is a whore, and she's my mother. What a great balance. Are you talking about unfaithfulness? You're talking about the church, unfaithful bride of Christ, failing to live up to its marriage vows to the Lord. It's a whore, but she's also my mother. I wouldn't be a Christian today, and I wouldn't know about Jesus, and I wouldn't have the Bible if it wasn't for this thing called the church. It has carried the truth for all of its flaws, for all of its shortcomings, for all of its weaknesses, for all of its whoring. It has still been that which has kept alive the gospel story down through the ages. I really wish I could show you my entire interview with Dr. Campolo because that church is a whore but she's my mother line was just a warm up. I watched John Stewart of The Daily Show on Tucker Carlson's show one night. And I felt that he let Carlson have it as he should. So I, I wanted to but come here today defense, let me and on. say, wait, wait, no, I just, no, let me, here, here, here's just one, what I wanted to tell you guys. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> stop, 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 stop hurting America. Okay, now. You're doing theater when you should be doing debate, which would be great. You do no, it's, it's, just it's not, not true. honest. And what you do is not element, honest. What you do is partisan honest. hackery. And I'll, and I'll tell you, you why I, I know You John Kerry it. on your show, and you sniff his throne, and you're accusing us of partisan hackery? Absolutely. You're You've a, got to be kidding, man. You're on CNN. And you say, My, the show that leads into me is puppets making crank phone calls. <laughs> what is wrong with you? And here, John Stewart, the comedian from Comedy Central, becoming the prophet of God saying, is this, we're not arguing whether you're right or wrong. We're simply saying, do you realize what you're doing when you frame the discussion in such an antagonistic, polarizing, hateful manner? Would Jesus sanction a book that belittles and ridicules a large segment of the American population? Yes. <laughs> Jesus would. Where would Jesus, can you point yes. to the passage where Jesus would approve of that? Well, there's the famed money changers passage, uh -huh. my favorite, probably yeah. what favorite of Sean's as well. I mean, liberals always uh -huh. think of Christ as, you know, some panty waist. No, we are called upon to wait, do wait, battle. Wait, wait. A movement can exist without a God, but never without a devil. There has to be an enemy to be destroyed. Battle Cry's mission is to empower America's youth to fight the culture wars and take back their generation. I want you to stand to your feet one at a time and shout as loud as you can, I want the cross! Battle Cry founder Ron Luce sees their mission as a response to the distorting influence of advertising and the mass media. We have parents we have community, we have church, that kind of have surrounded and insulated to help us raise our kids. But now with so much of the technology and media, it bypasses much of that natural protection, whether it's the internet or the iPod or advertising, and gets right to the kid. And so some are saying that this is the first generation to be more shaped outside the home than inside the home. First generation in the history of the world. 
The inaugural Battle Cry Stadium event drew 25,000 teens from all over Northern California to the city by the bay. For a weekend of concerts, sermons, and a little rally, they erupted into a virtual hyperbole festival. This is ABC 7 News at 6.30. Sex, drugs, and suicide. New at 6.30 tonight, a faith-based campaign for America's young people. The battle cry. Thousands of teenagers are gathering tonight for a Christian rally in San Francisco. And some of them are met today by scores of protesters telling them to go home. I've got to remind everybody in the tolerant city of San Francisco that not all fascists are Christians, and in fact, not all Christians are fascists. Number two, did that news lady really just say, sex, drugs, and suicide, new at 6.30? Sex, drugs, and suicide, new at 6.30. Third, do not hold a rally on the city hall steps and then be surprised that you stuck your nose into a hornet's nest. Now, I actually heard the people before I saw them, I heard them shouting and I thought, what's going on? It's like we put a finger in a beehive and we didn't know it. We didn't realize that it was kind of a hotbed for, um, you know, a very a violent response to people who represent the Bible. The symbolism of having it there was that this is the same place where the gay marriage is. Uh, this is San, San Francisco City Hall where you have uh, a couple years ago, uh, the mayor decided to bless, uh, as it were, gay marriages in San Francisco. So on the steps of City Hall, you had the battle cry folks, the, the Christian folks, and they were singing and praying and, and that. And on the other side, you had uh, just sort of a, a very quickly put together uh, all-star cast of San Francisco's uh, more colorful figures from the left. And so first thing they said to me is, um, so what do you think about, because most of them were men dressed up like women, so what do you think about these homosexuals? I said, oh, we love homosexuals. Now we don't like what they do, we don't like their lifestyle, but we love them as people. This is Sister Mary Timothy, a member of the Benevolent Order of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. I'll let you guess which side of the barricade the sister was on. Because it was a group of Christians coming to the city, which felt like condemning us. And when we got there, that's what it felt like. It was such a stark contrast. They're calling us angry, yet they were the ones angry. So when you say Christians, or something is a Christian cause here in uh, San Francisco, that rings a lot of bells for people. They probably had someone who called themselves a Christian really mistreat them, treat them very poorly. And um, now they think that's what all Christians are like. I went there to stand my ground. This is my city. This is a place I call home. They were shipping thousands upon thousands of children, not adults, to fight the battle, but children. This is a group that brainwashes children um, and, and molests them with ideas of uh, intolerance, hatred. What does it tell you about the kinds of Christians that they must have met before then? You know, it tells me that a lot of the Christians they run into are Christians that don't. They're hypocritical. They say they believe in God, and they do everything for God, but they, they don't love his people. They're I left there feeling really horrible that I was yelling at a bunch of children. You know, granted, they sent their children to do their bidding, and they should understand that San Francisco is not a city that just sits down and takes it, you know? But I still felt a little horrible that I was yelling at all these children. Jesus witnessed to the woman at the well who was a Samaritan woman who was like, you couldn't touch her. Like, that was totally wrong for a Jew to even be near her. And yet he was witnessing to the Samaritan woman. I know that if he was in that crowd of people, that he would be right there with the protesters trying to build a relationship with them just because he loves them so much. I mean, if you look at that picture, I look like an angry man. I look like an angry, angry man in that picture, or angry nun, drag queen. Um, I am a nun, I'm not a drag queen. Um, but the, I mean, if, from the outside, that's what it would look like. I just look like, you know, this angry man, drag queen that's got these things on his head that's screaming at a bunch of kids. So at the end of the day, what message did get sent? Here we live in a, quote, Christian nation, but we have a very unchristian culture. We have a culture that's violent, violently opposed to Christian values. And part of that is because um, people that have faith and values haven't spoken up very much. And so people without faith and without biblical values have spoken up. Whoever speaks up, they get to shape the culture. They win.
And what message was received? I'm not asking for your prayers. You know, it's like, but I love you and I just want you to, you know, come away from this lifestyle. And I said, well, it's not a lifestyle. It's my life, buddy. You know, like this is like my husband was standing next to me. I said, this is the man I married two years ago on these city hall steps. And here's your group coming here to my city where we celebrated the blessed union of ourselves. And you're preaching what you preach against us, you know, like that homosexuality is wrong, that Leviticus, blah, 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 and Sodom, Gomorrah, blah, blah, blah. I've heard it three million times before. You know, I'm tired of it. Come up with something new. Intentional or not, choosing City Hall for the Battle Cry rally did nothing to quell discord. And for the record, why didn't Battle Cry choose a more relevant mass media target? So it wasn't um, in your face about that particular, how the City Hall had been used in the past. It was more like, we happen to have an event here and um, give us time, we'll get to Hollywood and we'll get to S Madison Avenue. They all, you know, uh, need to uh, be pointed out that these forces are shaping and in a very destructive way our young people. They have every right to feel the way they do. At least, you know, these young people, they're taking a stand for something. I have to at least give them that. For those of you scoring at home, Battle Cry came back to San Francisco the next year and again held a rally on the City Hall steps. The way I tell it to my people is the church is the body of Christ. And for the last 50 years, the hands and the feet have been amputated. And all we've been is a big mouth. The phrase, the body of Christ, was used by Jesus to refer to his disciples who were called to continue his good works in his absence. Today, the body of Christ refers to his church all Christians who are collectively supposed to be representatives of the Lord here on earth. Yeah, about that. Over the last 2,000 years, Jesus' followers have managed to splinter into hundreds of denominations. The last body put together with more disparate pieces was Frankenstein's monster. And like Frankenstein's monster, the body of Christ has unwittingly stumbled about, managing to hurt, frighten, and anger the very villagers it's called to love. I, I really believe that the pagans and the abortionists and the feminists and the gays and the lesbians, the ACLU, people for the American way, all of them who tried to secularize America, I point the thing in their face and say, you helped this happen. Where'd the angry mob come from? Well, the body of Christ doesn't hear so good sometimes. We don't know how we sound to others. Understandably, the body of Christ doesn't like fire, and it's natural to be agitated, to want to separate from the culture and climb the nearest skyscraper. And yes, there will be enemies. Maybe we provoked them. Maybe they provoked us. But Jesus' high standard remains, love your enemy as yourself. The body of Christ can't be too hungry for the fight lest we become the monster. So the church is supposed to be that visible presence as the body of Christ today and as a witness to Christ. It often falls short, we're broken, we need Christ and we need the forgiveness of people outside the church. I think that a lot of us, we've been on this treadmill to try to get our performance acceptable to God, to the people that we're in front of. And at some point, you know, there's a lot of us who are so damaged that we're not good at this. And I'm convinced that, you know, legalism doesn't work very well for even people who are good at it. If they would call themselves Christ-likes instead of Christians, maybe it would remind them to act like Jesus Christ. Now, I don't like getting ripped by Bill Maher any more than you do. He's a bitter, pot-smoking, cynical know-it-all. And he's got a great point. I don't act very much like Jesus. Sorry about the old pothead thing, Bill. I was just fooling around. For me, this movie began on a trip to Africa where I met Ethiopian Christians who were full of joy, kindness, and grace, despite living with daily hardships that would snap me in half. They were happy simply because they believe God loves them. And I have to say, that really messed me up. And it got me thinking about the stark contrast between the followers of Jesus that I met in Africa and American Christians. I guess I'm thinking of those guys with the newsletters and microphones who are known for divisive, strident political rhetoric. Maybe the gospel of love isn't dividing. It's being turned into the gospel of being right. If everything you know about Christians you've learned from TV, well, you've probably heard plenty from the champions of the religious right.
This is not a right-wing extremist view. This is the way it has been for 3,000 years. Don't fool with the church because the church has buried a many a critic. And all the critics that we have not buried will make in funeral arrangements for them. When I was a kid, politics and religion were not discussed in polite company and certainly not in church. But times have changed and now the religious rights values voters are a political force responsible for electing a president twice. You know, Bush uh, says he's a big like Jesus guy. You know, Jesus didn't walk with a swagger. Jesus didn't go like, you know, see that uh, water I turned into wine? Me. That was me. <laughs> not a show off. See that blind guy over there that uh, he's not bumping into things anymore? <laughs> Jesus. That's <laughs> no. a blowhard. Yeah. <laughs> that big boulder I wrote, you know, from, uh, I rolled out of the entrance of the cave where I was dead. Now yeah. I'm alive. Yeah. Bring it on. You know, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Governor Bush, a philosopher thinker. And why? Uh, Christ. Because he changed my heart. There's no question that George W. Bush's openness about his faith was an asset in his campaigns for the presidency. In 2004, he received 80% of the evangelical vote, while Democratic nominee John Kerry remained quiet about his own faith. Seems as though uh, that, that Christianity has become the sovereign territory of the Republicans. Only because we embrace it. The Democrats don't embrace it. They're free to embrace it tomorrow. And embrace it, they did. In the run-up to the 08 elections, the Democratic nominees engaged in discussions of faith with candor and conviction. I believe in the power of prayer, and part of what I believe in is, is that through prayer, uh, not only can we strengthen ourselves in adversity, but that we can also find the empathy and the compassion and the will uh, to deal with the problems that we do control. Senator Obama even accepted an invitation from Pastor Rick Warren to join Senator McCain at Saddleback Church for an evening of civil discourse on the hot-button social issues, including gay marriage and abortion. Candidate Obama's willingness to openly discuss his religious beliefs translated to a double-digit increase among white evangelicals in key swing states, and Senator Barack Obama was elected the 44th President of the United States. God bless you. And may God bless the United States of America. I do think that there's a sense among, among voters that they look at, at politicians and, and they don't trust politicians, Republicans or Democrats. But if they see somebody who says, these are my beliefs and that I have some foundation for what I believe and what I say, that they take as something that makes them perhaps more trustworthy. No reading of American history, I defy anyone, no reading of American history could push religion out of the formation of the values of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. But it was, they were very careful not to say, Jesus, you know, created America, what would Jesus do is not an amendment. <laughs> I have to remember as a Christian that uh, what Uncle Sam says and what God says are often two different things. And I probably will never be able to get the two to align perfectly. With my head throbbing with all this church and state stuff, we rolled into the Twin Cities and caught up with Saturday Night Live alum and senatorial candidate Al Franken to get his take. There may be Christians who think that they're, that this is a Christian country when our Constitution is very, very, very clear. <laughs> I mean, re religious liberty and Christian country are two different things. They're the actual opposite. The federal judge has said the Pledge of Allegiance is unconstitutional for our children to say because it says one nation under God. So I think, for example, that under God probably shouldn't be in the Pledge of Allegiance. It wasn't put in there until like the 50s. Um, but it's not that big a deal to me. In God we trust probably shouldn't be in, on the coin. I don't care. <laughs> Do you believe that school children should be able to pray, pray in school? You know, I'd be perfectly happy to have a school prayer in the country if it were the Shema. You know, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hero Israel, Lord our God, Lord is one. Fine. You want prayer in school? That'll be it. Why are we counting on the government to have prayer in school? You know, we need to be praying with our 
children before they, in fact, go to school. Wait a second, did Reagan and Franken just agree with each other? It's easy to see how these issues raise questions for many Americans, one of them being Tom Kretmaker, who happens to write on religion and public life for USA Today, where he's on the board of contributors. George Bush said Christ changed his heart. Is that, was that enough for millions of people to vote for him? Well, that can be a, an inspiring statement and a, and a nice idea. Should that be the basis for someone voting for a candidate? No, I certainly don't think so. Two-term Pennsylvania Senator Rick Santorum, voted out with many other Republicans in the 06 midterms, feels that faith and politics cannot be separated. How do you determine what's right and wrong, uh, you know, without looking at some sort of moral code, uh, whether it's from the philosophers or whether it's from, you know, bubblegum wrappers? I mean, you get it from somewhere. And most people in America, not all, but most, get it from, from faith. I remember when I was uh, canvassing as a volunteer in the 04 election, I was canvassing for Kerry, yes. to be open about that. Um, I went to one woman's house, she opened the door, she said she's voting for Bush because he's a good Christian man, and she slammed the door on me. Case closed. <laughs> the crazy part about democracy, I mean, that's why Churchill said one time, uh, uh, democracy is the worst form of government in the world except for all the other forms. And part of our problem is that it's noisy, it's untidy, it uh, generates feelings, it generates emotions. Obviously, a lot of the moral questions of the day, uh, you know, we claim ownership of those answers. And, uh, and I think we need to, I'm not suggesting that we abandon that, that we, you know, we don't stand up for truth. Uh, but I think we have to do so in unless, in, uh, in unless a condemnatory fashion. Look, if they mean that we want to have a finer society where compassion prevails, we treat one another better, there's a sense of kindness and charity and justice, well, who could argue with that? If Jesus came back and was walking right down the street, do you think he would be a Republican or a Democrat or? He wouldn't matter to him. I don't think he'd care. I really don't. Democrat for sure. Really? Now why? Because he saved me. <laughs> he wouldn't care. I think he'd be peaceful, too. I think he'd just groove. That's all he'd do. Just look around like, dang it, man. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. We can argue about whether this country is a Christian nation or not, but every Sunday morning, four out of 10 Americans find their way to a church service. Want to know something funny? A recent Harris poll reports nine out of 10 Americans believe in the existence of God. That nine out of 10 of us are in agreement that we all come from a creator is amazing to me, especially considering we can only get four out of five dentists to agree on that pole sugarless gum controversy. Now, of course, when 9 out of 10 people say they believe in God, they're not all referring to the one that parted the Red Sea. Some people think God is a tree, or that God is that happy feeling you get on your birthday. Others think Clapton is God. And some think God lives somewhere out in the Horsehead Nebula and is still waiting for the Voyager space probe to arrive with his Chuck Berry. How do you think the universe began? Uh, by creation. <laughs> I have no idea. Evolution, I believe in that theory. It's just the idea of that happening. There has to be some sort of, some sort of intelligent force behind it. I don't know, but I think it had to do with God. Some say the Big Bang, but I want to know what happened before the Big Bang. He called day, day, and he called night, night. And that's how it started. It's God created. I read that somewhere, I think. In the Bible. I like that. That's what it's <laughs> It's all good. <laughs> I think that the scientific reason happened because of the biblical reason. How did the universe begin? I wish I knew. Evolution. We all came from like little creatures that crawled out the sea and... But before that? Before that, just a speck, an atom, a molecule from another planet. You know, there's an in whole intergalactic solar system out there. You that's think right. we're the only people on planets? No, no, but before that. Before that, planets before that, there was a big bang. I mean, we're going back and back and back. I can go back as far as you can go back. 
Let's break down the 2000 U.S. Census numbers. 75% of the country identify themselves as Christian. The split is about 50% Protestant, 25% Catholic. 125 million citizens identified themselves as born again, or evangelicals, though other sources say the evangelical total is probably closer to 80 million, and the National Association of Evangelicals have about 30 million members. But anyway, you slice it, that's a lot of followers. I used to go to Christian Coalition events quite often to kind of find out what the other people were, were talking about. And, and I like the people at Christian Coalition events. I, I'd say that the people at a Christian Coalition event are nicer than the people at the Democratic Convention, by and large. But there's like this 10% that are just kind of kind of not nice and kind of hostile and kind of angry about this whole thing. Uh, as, as a Jew, I don't believe that, uh, that Jesus was the son of God. I just don't believe that and I don't think. So I remember a guy going to me, so you're calling Jesus a liar. And I said, um, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't think so. And he says, well, Jesus said, when, when you look upon me, you look upon the Father. So you're calling Jesus a liar because you're saying he isn't God. And I said, okay, um, maybe it was a misquote. That could happen. That happens. Uh, maybe... Jesus said it, and he thought he was God, <laughs> and he's just a little woo, woo which the others thought knew was a joke. <laughs> and then I said, or maybe what Jesus meant is that when you look upon anyone, you look upon the Father. But there's God in all of us. Maybe that was that's what he meant. And like the other nine people all went, oh, that's that's really nice. And he just hated it. <laughs> and he just went like, like, I, I actually think he said, no, no one ever accused you Jews of not being clever. And I went, okay. You know, historically, it's the evangelicals and the charismatic Christians. And the flag lapel pin people and the Bible toting people, the people with the fish on their bumper, who are the ones to keep your eyes on. This collision of faith and culture is playing out on the car bumpers of America in the form of the Jesus fish. It's funny to me that this symbol of faith is so annoying to people, so much so that the Bill Maher fan club jumped into the primordial ooze and the Jesus fish evolved. And the Christians were like, Darwin, evolution? I don't think so. This ain't Russia. So here comes the truth fish to chomp on Darwin. Take that, secular humanist. But wait, look out. Here comes T-Rex to eat the true fish. Will these car bumper hostilities lead to Carmageddon? Alien. Evolve already. Fish and chips. The flying spaghetti monster. Satan. Science. Sushi. Dear church lady, I sometimes think you don't want to listen to anyone's opinion but your own. <laughs> well, Chucky, I can't hear you. I'm finding there's a translation problem when Christians try to talk to non-Christians. It's kind of like the ugly American abroad. We have no idea how we sound to others. God bless, you know God blesses America. That's a given. Everyone knows that. Does he, does he bless anybody else? Of course he does, and it's just that whole thing that the Americans aren't quite aware of the rest of the world sometimes. We met a gentleman yesterday that didn't think Scotland existed, yeah. and he was deadly serious. That people tend to talk to you as opposed to have a conversation with you. You're, you're trying to imply that God created the entire world, not just America. Not just America, and there are way more gods and way more religions than just a Christian mm -hmm. gods. and. If you know what I mean, I'm getting a bit tongue-tied. <laughs> that's it. It's because you're speaking heresy. That's why you're doing kind of there, There's a whole lot of us saying, being more concerned about being right, perhaps, than than demonstrating, you know, humility and, and love and compassion. I, yeah, I didn't, I don't see any place in the Bible where Jesus says to be right. And I see a lot in the Bible where he tells us to learn about love. If we don't get it together and start listening to each other, then I don't like the road we're taking. So when you have both the right active and thinking they're losing and the left active and thinking they're losing, that creates an atmosphere and a recipe for extremism.
By the time we got to Texas, the shiny buckle on the Bible belt, it was winter and the annual War on Christmas talk had kicked up. We Christians seem so ready to fight. And why not? We outnumber them. We can win. This week there was a highly attended conference in Washington called the War on Christians. Because nothing quite says I'm oppressed like the opulent Regency Ballroom of the Omni Shoreham Hotel. <laughs> Is a Christmas tree in a school an unconstitutional celebration of a religion. John, your war on Christmas is bogus. It doesn't exist. It's thinner than drugstore wrapping paper. Christmas trees can exist in public schools. The new law states we can't sing any songs having to do with Jesus or Santa Claus. So does anybody know any non-Santa or non-Jesus Christmas songs? Hey, I think this stuff is absurd too. I mean, I'm in Texas and I can't find a nativity scene. So guys, what are we putting up here? Is this a Christmas display or a holiday display? Holiday. Holiday, is that holiday. right? Can we have a mic, please? Yeah, it's a holiday. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So why, why can't we call it a Christmas display? Because it might offend other people, you know, to celebrate other holidays. I am a Jew, and every single one of my ancestors was Jewish. And it does not bother me even a little bit when people call those beautifully lit up, bejeweled trees Christmas trees. But I actually did begin to feel a little persecuted when I came upon this small restaurant all dressed up for Christmas and no baby Jesus. It was almost as if Christmas was being censored. Is it a holiday decoration or is it a Christmas decoration? Well, I guess both, yeah. Christmas and holiday, but I guess not to be so specific, just Christmas for people that celebrate Hanukkah and everything, so I guess it's just for both. Of course, I, I believe in Jesus Christ and I'm all for Christmas decoration, so, um, I mean, I guess it's okay to make everybody happy, but I, we celebrate Christmas at my house, so we just decorate with Christmas this stuff, so. By the way, the food at the dinner bell was great, and the service even better. And while I wouldn't call it a war on Christmas, seriously, where's baby G? By the time I got to Virginia, I realized it's my choice to be offended or not, but it's getting easier and easier to be offended. When I finally found a crash, the wise man from the east, the black man, had no hands. And the Christ child was blonde, blue-eyed, and needed rhinoplasty. Yes, us against them is fun and easy to play. It gets the voters out, it raises money, drives ratings, and outrage is way more exciting than humility. This country is polarized and we're loving it. Look out, Easter Bunny, you are not wanted in some places. Now the culture wars were raging in the heartland. The Easter Bunny had been removed from the city council offices in St. Paul, Minnesota. This, I had to see for myself. Did you hear about this business with the, the, the Easter Bunny uh, being removed from City Hall? Oh, uh, vaguely. Oh, did you hear about that? Did not hear about it. They took, they took the Easter Bunny away from City Hall. Jason Hoppen, who covers the city beat for the St. Paul Pioneer Press, broke the story after receiving a cryptic phone call. Just saying chicks, bunnies, everybody's mad. So I started checking into it and I found out that uh, the city's human rights director had asked that they be removed because they might be offensive to non-Christians. The bunnies. Uh, yeah. Non-Christians would be offended by it? Hmm. I am atheist. It can offend. It's just, I mean, it's just the Easter Bunny. It's not a big deal. People are making a big stink about it. Just it's something small, let it be. Let it go. We, we do take our human rights uh, very seriously in St. Paul. I think this is a case where just maybe we took it a step farther than, than it ought to have gone. And, and that's, that's where I came in and said, you know, we should really kind of back off on this. On the day the story came out, um, a box of marshmallow peeps appeared downstairs on a three-story statue that we have in the hall called the Vision of Peace. Uh, that box multiplied uh, over time uh, to include dozens and dozens of boxes and pictures and flowers and letters and things like that. And the county, which controls the building, left them up uh, until the day after Easter, and they were gone that Monday morning. So sort of a marshmallow bunny vigil. Exactly. The March of the Peeps. We were thinking since like you're in a town that's called St. Paul, maybe the safest thing would just be to rename the town, you know, to something less religious. You're right. We've got to do something about this.
job, so we enlisted our concierge to put her best calligraphy to parchment and draft a proclamation recommending St. Paul change its name. If you'd go along with this, yeah. Anne, okay? All right, okay. Whereas the citizens of St. Paul, Paul should, should not, not be subjected, subjected to religious imagery in, in the, the public, public square, square, such as Easter bunnies in the courthouse, and, and whereas the municipality uh, of St. Paul, Paul is, is in, in fact, fact named after St. Paul, Paul, a major, major religious figure. figure. We, the undersigned, move that the city of St. Paul be renamed. Uh, I, you know, I was doing so well. That the city of St. Paul be renamed to be religious neutral and less offensive. New Leningrad. <laughs> what do you think? Can you get behind New Leningrad? Hmm, I think I would just rather leave it St. Paul. Uh, great thought. I think we'll stick with St. Paul, though. I think that's a terrible idea. I think this is the way it is, and it's been that way for a reason. Look, you know? look I'm just throwing out an idea. I can't guarantee that New Leningrad, if you've got a better idea. I don't. Now, the ACLU, for one of a scapegoat, has been putting a pinch on public expressions of religion, and now nobody's sure what's okay and what's not. So what does the ACLU want? What do Americans really want? No religious imagery in the public square? Fine. St. Paul is hereby known as New Leningrad. But wait, there are also St. Pauls in Arkansas, Indiana, Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, Oregon, Texas, and Virginia. Let's just rename them all New Leningrad. Oh, no. But St. Paul isn't the only city moniker with religious roots. North Carolina has a town named Eden, as in Garden of Eden? <laughs> yeah, that ain't gonna fly. And neither are the Edens in Idaho, Maryland, Texas, Vermont, Wyoming, the two in New York, or the three in Wisconsin. So, what to call them? How about we name them after Hugo Black, the Supreme Court Justice who removed prayer from America's public schools. Eden is hereby renamed Black City. Oh wait, I don't want to offend the white supremacists. Let's go with Hugo City. Frankly, our forefathers really made a mess of things when they started naming cities. Clearly oppressed and coerced by the dominant religious institutions of the day, settlers went nuts naming cities after saints. We've got St. John, St. Peter, St. Petersburg, Petersburg, St. Mary's, St. Charles, St. Louis, St. Albans, St. Michael, St. Ignatius. I can't even name them all. Curse you, Thomas Jefferson, and your religious liberty. So St. John is now Havanaville. St. Peter is Michael Moropolis. St. Petersburg is Roe v. Wade City. Petersburg is Frankenheights. We're gonna change St. Mary's to Garofaloburg. St. Charles to Lenintown, named after the commie, not the beetle. Though either works, really. And let's change St. Louis to simply Alec Baldwin. So people can say things like, I live in the burbs outside Alec Baldwin, or it sure is hot in Alec Baldwin this summer. See, I can do hyperbole. Oh, look, I understand why we Christians get fired up, and maybe some of my ire is justifiable, but outrage and being more right than them doesn't remind me of Jesus. Ask Ann Coulter, what happens when you fight fire with fire? Okay, I'll tell you. You get a bigger fire. Uh, have you heard, heard this, this phrase, the culture wars kicking around? Where, oh my gosh, the, the, the secular humanists are taking over America, and oh, we can't have it. I can imagine because you said it, but I've I never heard of it. I have never heard that phrase before. The culture wars. No. What's that about? Well, some people wear Prada, some people wear Versace. It's just a huge war out there. There is a culture war going Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Let's educate the people. What is the culture war? And why is it so important? Well, the culture war is between secular progressives like yourself. I am not a secular progressive, sir. No. I am a deep religious man who will do anything you say. Go ahead. <laughs> Welcome to the Culture Wars, the game show that knows the headlines are the front lines. Let's meet our team. On your left, the liberal media elite. On your right, the young conservatives. Since so much of the heat behind the Culture Wars can be traced to our inability to think like the other guy, we took a page from my favorite 70s game show to see if we could get polar opposites to think outside of their respective boxes. Name a reason you would consider having an abortion. Ooh, I would say life of the mother. Let's see if that is on the board. Mother at risk, they're on the board, all right. You guys might want to get ready if they miss this one. Reason, uh, rape. Rape, okay. Rape, show me rape. And it is the number one, number one on the board. The young conservatives got off to a fast start, but things went downhill from there. I think, I think we're gonna do incest. 
not not literally, but I mean, right, yeah, should we're gonna we, go should we leave? We're gonna go you guys want a moment? Dim the lights. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. These young conservatives are different than they are in the books. All right, so show me incest. A reason that you would consider an abortion? No. They did a much better job of understanding who we were than we did of who they were. We understood the game. The game wasn't about what our opinion was. It was about these how many people surveyed. I so heard that a number of people would say that there is no reason. An, okay, so you're that saying anyone should have an abortion. Uh, you would consider an abortion. You guys are saying no reason. We think there are people who would say there's, that there's no say. reason. Okay, hundred people surveyed. Did any of them say no reason? Oh, yeah. Correct. Yeah. They did. It was really, I think it was really important to us. I don't know what it was like for them, but it was important to us to show that we were smarter really don't like liberals. All right, very good. Jonathan, tell me a little about yourself. I'm the Western Regional Vice Chairman for the Young Republican National Federation, and I motivate young people to get involved in politics and go make a difference. Now, young Republican, how young do you have to be to be a young Republican? Uh, that's 18 to 40 years old. Okay. Is the 40 age. still young when yeah. you're talking about Republicans? Yep. <laughs> right. Right. You're a columnist for the Oregonian? That's right. What, what's the, what's the, your favorite part about that job? I, I enjoy the total freedom I have, and when um, I also do a couple things on the side. I, I uh, burn American flags, and I officiate at gay marriages whenever possible. <laughs> well, you've earned your liberal media flag. You. Whether it was abortion or um, Darwin or something, they were able to pick off the board some of our answers, but it was harder for us to pick off the board some of their answers. Name the most intriguing aspect of Darwin's theory of evolution. Dave. Survival of the fittest. All right, show me. There it is, natural oh. selection, the top answer. I, I was surprised that the conservative team didn't seem to be more in touch. Name the most intriguing aspect of Darwin's theory of evolution. Big, Big Bang. Bang. The Big oh, Bang. they Big changed Bang. their answer. Oh, guys. No, I wasn't sure that Big Bang was part of Darwin's theory. Don't talk about it. It's, uh, it's not. Okay. To, All right. Show me, show me Big Bang. Oh, sorry. The Christian conservatives kind of got uh, beat, <laughs> to say the least. We could not get outside of the world we live in. Every answer was right from where we live. The liberal media elite crushed the young conservatives 248 to 27. I wondered if age had anything to do with the Christian team getting stomped by the liberals, so we put together a game between college-age students. One team from Reed College, dubbed the Agnostic Scholars, faced off against the Young Believers, a group of Christians assembled from Portland-area universities. Name something homosexuals are known for. Style. Oh. Oh. I thought perhaps the young believers might be more flexible in their thinking, less set in their ways, than the young conservative team. Wrong. Turns out the young believers had even less life experience considering the views of the other guy, and the agnostic scholars shut them out. 327 to nil. After vanquishing the Christians, agnostic scholar Captain Derek stepped forward to face the speed round. Name something Jesus is known for. Dying for our sins. Name a movie that has generated controversy in our culture. Passion of the Christ. Name a Sunday school lesson that is relevant in your life. Uh, do unto others as they would do unto you. Derek understood Christians better than Christians seemed to understand him. And if that doesn't improve, we're going to live in a divided America for a long time. But here's the really cool part of this story. After the taping, the young conservative team and the liberal media elite team hung out in the green room together for two hours and talked. I actually liked some of those people after we would talk to them for a few hours, like, man, these are some nice people that we don't probably agree with a lot philosophically and you know politically, but they're, they're nice people. What we discovered in the back room talking was, if you take people who have you know opposing points of view and you sit them down long enough and talk about it, you, and you make it personal, everybody eventually finds a middle ground. We need to reach out to one another. And even though we disagree, and, and especially on such of the major issues in, in society, um, liberals and conservatives need to reach out to each other and be compassionate to one another. If we, if we had the, the courage to act in public like we do in private and give people that respect that we were showing each other backstage and letting each other finish our sentences and say, oh yeah, I agree with you on the first part, the, the second part I have a tough time with, and just being less defensive, obviously, the conversation sounded a lot different backstage than it did out front. 
in the conversation with each other, we've got a chance to work through these important, complex, hot-button social issues. We've got to be careful not to oversimplify, and remember, no hitting. Marriage is between a man and a woman. They want to knock it down and create a brand new secular, uh, in some ways, anti-religious tradition. They're not primarily monogamous. So why would they want to bind themselves into a legal entanglement that they can't get out of? Threat to marriage is adultery and divorce. I think there is a battle for marriage, but it's in my house and it's in your house. With a full third of first marriages, Christian and otherwise, already ending in divorce, maybe we're the enemy. We are, after all, a society that abides abortion on demand. 24 represents the percentage of young girls who get abortions who say they're Catholic. 43 represents the percentage of young girls who get abortions who say that they're Protestant. 14 represents the percentage of girls who get abortions who say they're evangelical, born-again Christians. So my question when I talk to these groups is, you know, you're looking at the government to pass a law to stop our daughters from getting abortions. But what are we doing wrong in our own households? But to go in and see a movie about gay cowboy sex, that's a big turnoff for a lot of people. The Hollywood agenda? <laughs> when are we gonna own up to our part in this division in America and quit blaming some sinister force out there? Hollywood's agenda is money. It's always money. It's always money with Hollywood. I don't really think there's any Hollywood agenda. Hollywood follows trends and fashions. When you make a movie like The Rookie or you make a movie like Radio, people often come up to me and say, why doesn't Hollywood make more of those movies? And you don't want to know what the answer is because people don't go to see them. So it's easy to point over to Hollywood and say Hollywood is corrupting the country. You know, we see, we see crap out there like Jackass 2. We see, why, why, did, why does Hollywood keep making them? Because people go see them. You know, uh, when it comes to the poor, I'm not a liberal or conservative, I'm a radical. <laughs> I want to do something. It's not a coincidence that in the scriptures, poverty is mentioned uh, more than 2,100 times. It's not an accident. It's a lot of airtime. I mean, one of the things I've tried to do in the course of my time in the Senate is to try to be someone who says to, to people of faith and conservatives and Republicans that we have to be a, a, a movement that, that cares about the people that Jesus cared about, which, you know, which were the poor. You know, I don't know about this doctrine of assassination, but if he thinks we're trying to assassinate him, I think that we really ought to go ahead and do it. It's a whole lot cheaper than starting a war. Amongst believers, I've heard more yelling about the war on Christians than I have thoughtful discussions about the war in Iraq. Artist Kenny Higdon's exhibition, A Question for Christians, asks some tough ones. The idea of turning the other cheek, which is maybe an impossible ideal, but it's an ideal. And it's one that I would think that Christians would at least acknowledge uh, is a long ways from preemptive strike. Anybody want to take that one? I think that Jesus was all about breaking down every barrier of who was in and who was out. Racism is still an open wound in need of healing. Why aren't we talking more about that? In the end, then, what is called for is nothing more and nothing less than what all the world's great religions demand, that we do unto others as we would have them do unto us. God created us equal, that we are not equal in our accumulation, we're not equal in our energy, we're not equal in all that but we are equal in the sense that as human beings with value and worth, in God's sight, and God wants that value and worth. We're simply saying that we believe most Americans believe in matters of faith and family and decency. You know, one of the most successful Hollywood industries is the porn industry. Tens of millions, including a shocking number of churchgoers and pastors, are affected by pornography. That one a little close to home? We're all in the same boat. Uh, we all got problems. We all got things that we got to deal with. And we got to start dealing with them. And we got to stop me focusing so much attention on everybody else's garbage and focus on our own a little bit. Mike Foster and fellow youth pastor Craig Gross founded the TripleXChurch.com as an online resource for those struggling with porn addiction and as an outreach for those in the adult film industry. They even buy a booth at adult film expos and hand out Bibles with a special Jesus Loves Porn Stars cover. 
But who wants to fight with these pastors? It's not the porn star. You need to be terrified of what he's going to do for you, to you, for what you're actually basically doing. Get your hands off that pig. In Triple X Church, we always say that, that Jesus loves porn stars as much as he loves pastors. I mean, that's um, who he is, and that's why I follow him. And when are we going to talk about America's addiction to consumption? Keeping up with the blitz. Shopping five and dime stores. Do you want me rich or do you want me poor? I don't know anymore. The major problem with this culture is not the gay issue, is not the abortion issue, as important as these are. The thing that's going to destroy evangelical Christianity in the next 25 years, and it will, is its willingness to be at home with the commercialism and with the consumerism of our society. Prosperity is the biggest part of our faith right now. You know, it's easier for the, a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get in heaven. That, now it is, if you're rich, that must mean that you're good because you're rich because you deserve it, because God loves you. It, it's, it, it's totally flipped. What are we really after? What kingdom are we really after? Christ's kingdom or American privilege? That's my real concern in all this. Our kids are growing up as consumers, not as people who are committed to the mission of God in the world. We should believe in humility. We should believe in being generous to people who are in need. There are some basic religious principles that could bind us together that are now dividing us uh, very severely down the middle. On this journey, I'm struggling with the perception of my faith being the ailment rather than the cure. We have, I have to do better, especially because I found that most of the people who have a problem with Christians don't have a problem with Jesus. Uh, name something that Jesus Christ is known for. Love. Forgiveness. I'd say forgiveness. Saving the world. Christmas. Wearing sandals. Jesus saves. Faith, hope, and charity. Magic tricks. I mean miracles. No, I'm in magic tricks, yeah. <laughs> what's, your, what's your favorite magic trick? The one with the cards or the goldfish or the... I'll go with water into wine, my man. <laughs> that ain't a bad little trick. Dying for mankind. Dying for our sins. I don't know how we, what it was that he was, but I know he was put up on that cross. Walking on water. A great middle name, H. Hmm, healing the sick, right. loving the poor. Caring for the least, the least of people, people in, in greatest distress. I'm always fascinated to see that when disaster strikes, insurance companies get religion. If something expensive was broken, it was an act of God. Well, there are some Christians who felt Hurricane Katrina was an act of God, an act of vengeance upon the sin-loving gamblers and gays along the Gulf Coast and those who tolerated them. But there were others among the faithful who saw people in distress and rushed in to help. Six months after Katrina, I traveled to Biloxi, Mississippi, searching for Grace's fingerprints and God's wrath. You know, they need to go back and check, you know, because when rain comes, it rains on the just and the unjust. And this was an act of nature that was devastating. One thing that this storm did was to place everyone on, on basically the same level, regardless of ethnicity, the color of your skin. Katrina didn't care. But I don't believe that it was just God's direct will to go to the coast and kill all those people. There was a God-given purpose for a storm as such. It was to wake up the Christian community. And I see a far higher purpose in that than punishing a community because of uh, certain sinfulness. And, you know, the, the French Quarter stood tall after the storm. It wasn't damaged. So the assertion doesn't make sense, and it doesn't make biblical sense to me. Uh, are you here helping your brothers, or are you just sitting up here talking? Uh, that's what I want to know. If you're not here on the ground trying to do something about it and just standing there talking about, oh, that was a, uh uh If all you want to do is judge, then you're not doing what God has for you to do. So what did we find in Biloxi? The damage and loss and suffering? Nearly unbearable. Living in a FEMA trailer for a year? They've been a bigger test than the hurricane itself. But did we find God? Yeah, I think we did. And I don't think he brought the storm as an act of vengeance. The act of God was in the recovery. You see just van after van after van, bus after bus after bus with, you know, uh, 
a, a Baptist church from, from Georgia or a, or a, a Methodist church from Illinois or, or you know, it, it's just, it's mind boggling to see. I mean, this is the first time something of this traumatic has happened to us. And I don't mean to put the race card or anything into this thing, but um, there has been a tremendous amount of white people, you know, that have come here. And, you know, their hearts just poured out to not just blacks and Vietnamese. Uh, I mean, it has been to all races. In this area where we're working predominantly African-American, and you've got coming from the rest of the country predominantly Caucasian coming in and predominantly opposite political ends of the spectrum as well. And we're all mixing together and working and loving each other. And it's a beautiful thing. You know, the South is long, you know, we've had our, our problems and while we all, this, this, this helps. Good things come out of bad things, that's one of them. This type of uh, love I never encountered before in my life and I'm 62 years old and I never encountered this much of affection toward people that don't even know me. You know, people care about each other and uh, that they're willing to, to give uh, part of themselves, reach out to help other people and, you know, ultimately that's what it's all about. The good Lord has come in and shown people how you're supposed to help people. Not exactly, you know, the politics part, but how God worked and to coming in and helping and wanting everybody to help each other. My mission uh, is that those that are around me, when they leave me, are convinced that I love them and that I love them because God loves them too. It is love is actually stronger than hate. And, and it was going to be love in the end that was going to uh, break the barriers. Love conquers everything. And we can keep that kind of feeling going long after this hurricane. Not only this area, but the rest of the nation will be so much better. I came away from Biloxi with great empathy for those who suffered. I was moved by stories of grace, but I wondered why so often it takes a disaster for us to truly meet people where they're at. Now, for years, I've worked in the advertising world. I sit around with smart, funny people, trying to figure out creative ways to convince you to buy something you can't live without. So naturally, I looked at this religion-culture disconnect as a marketing problem. Maybe the church just doesn't know how to communicate a core message to a target market. Maybe the gospel of love simply isn't cutting through the media clutter. But fortunately, there are some people who understand how to communicate in the information age. In this box are 38 million people who are ready to go to work. Rock singer and humanitarian Bono used an advertising campaign to raise awareness about the crisis in Africa. Some three million Americans have already lent their names to the One Campaign, which aims to make extreme poverty history. Stop asking God to bless what you're doing. Get involved in what God is doing, because it's already blessed. And when you start moving in the proper direction, you can even get Pat Robertson and George Clooney on the same page. And I called up Pat and I said, we need you. You know, Dr. Robertson, you and I are never going to agree. We're going to agree that we don't agree on anything except there are no two sides to this issue. And he said, okay. He and I did Nightline together. Uh, I went on the 700 Club on his show and talked. Now, it's funny for me to be doing that. This is what happens when God gets on the move. Crazy, crazy stuff happens. Popes were seen wearing sunglasses. <laughs> Jesse Holmes had a ghetto blaster now. <clears throat> Evidence of the spirit moving. It was really, it was breathtaking. From raising awareness at U2 concerts and Live Aid's epic world stage to appearing on Oprah to launch Product Red, Bono is using his unique gifts and the tools of the 21st century to reach out to a world in need. How's that old St. Francis quote go? Preach the gospel constantly, use words only when necessary. He's a doer. The thing about this good citizen of the world is he's used his position to get things done. You're an amazing guy, Bono. God bless you. God bless you. But the one thing we can all agree, all faiths, all ideologies, is that God is with the vulnerable and the poor. God is in the slums, in the cardboard boxes where the poor play house. 
God is in the silence of a mother who has infected her child with a virus that will end both their lives. God is in the cries heard under the rubble of war. God is in the debris of wasted opportunity and lives. And God is with us if we are with them. Seems like the divisive political voices are being replaced at the microphone with people who want to unite, uplift, and help others. You may have heard of Pastor Rick Warren. He's the pastor at Saddleback Church in Orange County, California for the last 25 years. About 25,000 faithful attend each weekend. He wrote a book that begins with the line, It's Not About You, which has sold over 30 million copies and is printed in 56 languages. Because of the financial windfall from a purpose-driven life, Rick no longer takes a salary from Saddleback. In fact, he returned 24 years of paychecks. Oh, and he gives 90% of his money to fund charities to fight AIDS and poverty at home and abroad. And I did that because I knew that I was being put under the spotlight. And I didn't want anybody to question my motives. Of in case you're curious, Pastor Rick doesn't have a home in Tuscany, a Rolls Royce collection, and he doesn't own a jet airliner either. And these stereotype-breaking decisions recently caught a Time Magazine reporter off guard. The first question the author, uh, the, the editor, the reporter asked was, uh, what's your salary? Which I thought, okay, here's another fat cat megachurch pastor fleecing the flock. And I said, well, honestly, I've now served my church for free for 25 years. <laughs> her, her face went wide and I thought, it was worth every penny just to say <laughs> that. You know, I had to repent of my pride, but I really felt sure. good for about a minute. The president of Rwanda read The Purpose Driven Life and called Rick for help. So Pastor Rick went. The purpose of influence is to speak up for those who have no influence, and that changed my life. It turned my, my whole car. I had to repent and said, I will spend the rest of my life using whatever influence I've got for those who have little influence. I like Pastor Rick because when I hear him talk, I feel a little less crazy. I honestly don't care what your motivation is to do good, as long as you do good. You know who else I think Jesus likes? Nelson Mandela. Yeah, I, I know, who's against Mandela? But this guy spends 27 years in prison, and when apartheid finally falls in South Africa, Mandela's not about revenge, he's about reconciliation. That makes no sense, and I love it. What a beautiful way to leave this place, strengthened by your faith, and blessed you say with pain, but I bet you're smiling. When Pope John Paul II passed away, I remember watching the news coverage recapping his remarkable papacy. His efforts at reconciliation with Muslim and Jewish religious leaders was encouraging. There was great power in his visits to Auschwitz and the Wailing Wall. And the 1981 meeting with his would-be assassin to offer his personal forgiveness was what you'd hope for from a pope. But still, it was a beautiful, stunning example of loving your enemy. The Catholic Church is unambiguously committed to protecting and cherishing every human life. But the thing that really knocked me off my feet was a speech he gave in March 2000, the Jubilee Apology, where the Pope confessed the crimes of the Catholic Church. <laughs> Never heard that before. Apologizing for the Crusades? The Inquisition? The priest scandals? Coming clean on all the stuff the Church had denied for centuries. This type of demonstration of love, grace, and humility can move hearts and make this world a better place. And what a way to say goodbye. I've been around the world, been in hundreds of conversations, and have a better understanding of the divisions in our country. And now my journey brought me home to Portland, Oregon. In a recent Gallup poll on religious affiliation, 18% of Oregonians surveyed checked the nun box, making Oregon the most unreligious state in America. It's also the only state where assisted suicide is legal. Plus, godless Portland has more strip joints and more lesbians per capita than any U.S. city. But Portland is also the setting for a wonderful redemptive book called Blue Like Jazz by Donald Miller. My favorite bit in the book takes place at the then least religious college in America. Don and a buddy nicknamed Tony the Beat Poet hung out at Reed College for a season, befriending the handful of Christian students on campus. That's Tony on the left there. 
Well, Don and Tony were attempting to engage Reed in a positive way, which demanded grace and creativity, especially in light of Reed's post-final exam debauchery, known as Renfair. One of us threw out, I remember who it was, the idea, well, we should do a confession booth. And then uh, at one point in the conversation, I, I just made this comment. I said, no, we, we, we won't ask them to confess to us. We'll confess to them. And it kind of landed a bit like a stone in the middle of the room. And we kind of sat around and looked at each other. And, and it was just clearly something that felt like it was a God idea. Yeah, this whole confession thing worked for the Pope, but how's it going to play on the campus of Pagan State University? We spent a whole weekend, and it seems like that chair was never empty. As soon as somebody came up and got out, somebody would walk up and just wander inside and sit down. The conversation would start again. Hi, it's a confession booth. It's a place where confessions are heard. If it's okay, I'd like to begin. The experiment at Reed went one step beyond the Pope's apology. It became interactive. You know, students would just be like completely caught off guard and the response would be something like that's the most effing beautiful thing I've ever heard in my entire life and then after a moment of silence every time the students would stop and go here's a little bit of my story my dad used to beat the crap out of me when I was a kid and from the time I was two to the time I was five and then the story would just unfold pain abuse addiction whatever it was and they would just pour their story out and we would sit and we would talk there's a lot to be gained or lost, depending on how we choose to engage others. If we love somebody, we go out of our way to learn the best of who they are. Thinking about Tony Criz, Bono, and the Pope, something clicked. We've used up all the words. That's why these followers who are reaching out to others make sense to me. I wondered what would happen if we moved this confession booth off campus and into the middle of the culture wars. What if we reached out to the folks most hurt by we Christians? We rented a space at Portland's Waterfront Park to join the festivities at Pride Northwest. There we would invite people, probably mostly gay people, into the confessional booth to hear my confession. If how Christians talk and how Christians don't listen is our part of the divide in America, then I want to try a little humility, a little compassion, a little friendship. I did wonder how I would be received by a group generally treated with hostility by Christians. I even met with a local gay advocacy group who were pretty discouraging. Don't bother, they said. Everybody at Pride just wants to party. I'd be surprised if anyone stops by your confessional. But just as I was starting to waffle a little, a friend sent me a pretty interesting email. Turns out, God is going to destroy Portland with a tsunami during Gay Pride Weekend as an act of vengeance against the wi- All right, never mind. You guys know how this whole thing goes, but that was according to some local pastor's prophetic dream. Well, now I had to go through this confession booth idea. If I was going to be taken out in a flood, at least I was going to be doing what I felt God had called me to do. Father, for I have sinned. It's been about a month since my last confession. These are my sins. And, you know, um... Yeah, I did that a couple times, you know, and I just I could make fun of it today, but I mean, it's like even thinking back where they slide that thing and you're not supposed to really see them and they know who the hell you are, you know. <laughs> Turns out small talk is pretty easy, but apologizing would be hard. For, first off, I, I want to apologize uh, and confess the, the sins on behalf of the, the church that I love and I'm a part of um, for the, uh, for, for the judgment and the condemnation uh, against gay people. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jesus teaches us to love one another. He teaches us to love our brothers as ourselves. And our, our church hasn't done that, and, and I haven't done that. And so I, I want to apologize to you for that. I, I want to apologize for <clears throat> the church uh, ignoring the AIDS crisis when it emerged 30 years ago. And not only did we ignore it, you know, we piled on. Uh, and called it a gay plague, and, and we caused fear and anger and resentment and, and more hurt in a, in a time when, you know, faith and love and compassion were what we're called for, and so I apologize that we, we failed our brothers and sisters in that regard. Absolved. No, I don't know what to say. It's different. <laughs> I'm not used to hearing anyone who's a Christian ever say anything really nice, so. Your uh, apology about the AIDS 
thing uh, really kind of, kind of touches me. Um, I wish that more people had, had that feeling in, in early on, uh, having lost so many friends. There are, as you mentioned, a lot of hard feelings out there from uh, from many in the gay community who said, you know, all you wanted to do was condemn us. You know, uh, you, you said, you know, that AIDS was the scourge that was going to wipe out us because we were the, uh, you know, we were we were folks who were who were evil, um, and we forgot to look at these people as children of God. That should that should break the heart of any Christ follower to think that these people uh, who are created in God's image were treated as trash, as throwaways, as people that have no worth or value. Yeah, you know, I have to be honest, Dan, one of the things that kept me from being a Christian was being treated so poorly by Christians. And have, you, have you heard, so you've, you've experienced personally what I'm talking about. Sure, I'm gonna burn hell for all eternity, is what I've been told, so I grew up in a Southern Baptist church. And so I'm very familiar. They, I was in the Bible trivia club, so I got a lot of it memorized. Now, your parents taught Sunday school, you say. Mm -hmm. uh, how old were you when you came out? Um, 13. I was 13. So what was their reaction? Um, they put me in therapy. I went through a period where I was homeless, and I wasn't invited to any sort of family gathering, Christmases, anything like that with my Catholic families. Did you still go to church? Do you go? Oh, God, no. I've <laughs> gone since I was uh, out of the house. As soon as I was out, out of the house, I quit going to church. Why would I go someplace where um, judgment is thick? We were connecting, but that didn't mean there weren't some misunderstandings. I suppose you're queer, you know, so I, I don't know, but... You are gay, right? Are you gay? No. You're not gay? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm not. Oh, you're not? <laughs> no. <laughs> 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 well, that just knocks me out. That, your lover told me that already. Oh, he did? Okay. Uh, well, then, uh, my <laughs> actually, I'm married, so that's just my business partner. <laughs> oh, he said, well, he said partner. You know, this is more meaningful to me now that you've said that you're not gay and that you're, that, that, um, you're doing something because you feel like it's a good thing to do. That's, that's nice. That's cool. I appreciate that. And yes, there were some hard feelings and some tough questions. It doesn't feel like a very Christian country, does it? Think that the Christians are gonna hate your movie, or? And where is the, where is Christ in the message? And I, and I, don't, I don't hear Christ in the message anymore. I don't get it. The crucifiers, you know? God loves everybody. We're human. Why, why are you gonna do this to us? And I find it a little hard for you apologizing for the Lord. <laughs> do you feel like you're more able to do that than the rest of us? You're not wearing a collar and we're at gay pride. So what are the accomplishments of Christianity? But the fact that you're apologizing for the whole entity kind of freaked me out. So don't why don't you jump ship? Because People of faith need to stand up and say, Jesus came to save us, all of us, and not a select few. And the conservatives in this country, they don't get to set the agenda for God. No matter who the person is, whether they agree with me ideologically or in lifestyle, my mandate from Scripture is to, to love them. And so we painted the face of God with the face of our parents or fathers or abusers or something, and we end up with theology that is Western rationalistic, deity at a distance, disapproving and looking for an excuse to punish. You could condemn many of the things that I've done in my life uh, and continue to do in all likelihood of, that, are, that, are, that are wrong. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you have the right to condemn me and not love me. You have to love me. It's what you're called to do. I gotta tell you, I was completely surprised by two things. The power of an apology and the willingness of people to engage. I think the apology created the foundation for the conversation. Um, lastly, I guess, uh, although the list could be numerous, I want to apologize for, for my own personal, uh, my own personal sins of, 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 you know, partaking in gay jokes, laughing at them, telling them myself, for for being uh, uh, allowing fear to drive me rather than than faith, for being put off. Being
being offended uh, in, in ways that, that Jesus would not want me to be, in ways that are selfish and, and hurtful to others, selfish uh, and, 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 yeah, well, frankly, hurt, hurtful to others when, when Jesus is really clear about how he asks for me to, to love one another. And I apologize for, for not doing that, for not loving you the way that I should. I accept your apology, and I want to say thank you for speaking up because I'm tired of people not speaking up anymore. We should all apologize for all the things that we've done and thought and said, and just move on from there. It's very touching, um, the apology. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm worthy of receiving the apology. That's that's the the, uh, the hard thing. Oh, that's very nice. And I forgive you, and thank you. And um, I wish that there were more people who would think at all about that. Thank you so much right. for, for speaking this to me. I appreciate hearing these words. It does a lot to heal my heart. I was just thinking the same thing. How could Jesus' followers hate so much? And so it's lovely to hear this from you and know that you don't always hate us. Turns out that tsunami never showed up, but I did peek a few times, though mostly I was looking for nuns in clown makeup. I wanted to tell them I was friends with Sister Mary Timothy. Now, I don't know what you think of Tim, but would it make a difference to you to learn that his mother died when he was four? His dad and stepmother were habitual drug users? And the first time he had sex at age 16, he contracted HIV. Today, I call Timmy my friend. He reminds me that life and people are complicated. Compassion should be given and not earned, and that everyone has a rest of the story. When I was in high school, there was this boy named Roger, and he was outed, a gay kid, and his homosexual orientation became known. West Philadelphia High was a huge and tough inner city school. You can imagine what we did to this kid some 50 years ago when ignorance prevailed on this issue. We humiliated this kid at every turn. On Fridays, after phys ed, when all the other kids would go into the shower, Roger wouldn't go in with us, he was afraid to. When he took his turn, we waited for him with our wet towels, and when he came out, we would whip them and sting his little body. I wasn't there the day that they took Roger and dragged him into that shower room and shoved him into the corner. And while he yelled and screamed for mercy, five guys urinated all over him. I wasn't there when that happened. He went home, he went to bed at about 10 o'clock, they say it was about two o'clock in the morning that Roger went down to the basement of his house and he hung himself. And I knew I wasn't a Christian because if I was a Christian, I would have been Roger's friend. You don't have to legitimate somebody's lifestyle in order to love that person, to be brother or sister to that person and to stand up for that person. We've all judged and hated, feared, who are we going to be in this life? And when are we going to start being it? Say we watched the tape, we were wrong, we're going to get that one. This is Sheila Hamilton, news director at Portland rock station Kink FM. And she recently traveled to Ethiopia with Christian relief organization World Vision in an effort to find sponsorship for 400 AIDS orphans. This was the first time World Vision had ever paired up with a secular rock station. Apparently, World Vision has partnered with Christian radio stations like this for decades, and Christian listeners are well aware of being asked to help in these kinds of fundraisers. And they'd never done it with secular radio because they didn't think secular listeners would care. And I guess I find that, at the same time, appalling and fascinating because here I was looking for a way to get involved with Africa. I don't go to church on Sunday morning. I'm not a big Bible reader, but I have values and morals and I care about what's happening on the other side of the world. And while World Vision had been skeptical of the secular media, Sheila was skeptical of the Christian world. My greatest fear, I think, was that I would go into these camps where children were dying of AIDS and that I would see Christians proselytizing. To and then what did you actually see once you got there? Mostly what we saw was their great work. We saw them delivering bags of seeds. We saw them building wells, bringing 
incredible uh, farming capacity to those people that have never in their lives seen anything beyond a hoe. We went over there with the idea of like, if we could get 400 of these children that we meet sponsored, if we could do that, it would have been wildly successful. And I thought, how in the world do you get a soccer mom who is worried about public schools and who is worried about her taxes to care about a place on the other side of the world? And they're beautiful kids. I mean, they're absolutely beautiful. And I was thinking about how many of them, number one, hadn't had breakfast? How many of them probably didn't get a square meal? And yet they, ha they had so much joy. I brought out these little SpongeBob SquarePants stickers, and you know, they're corny little stickers, but they're clamoring in line for a chance to get this little sticker. And because their clothes were, ugh, their clothes were so filthy that you know, when you press it against them, it would fall off. And so they would pick it up out of the dirt and all day long you would see little kids holding this sticker to their chest because they were so thrilled to have something that meant, you know, I have this little piece of America. And I thought it was really interesting that while in Africa, Sheila experienced how powerful a demonstration of true love can be. Seeing the work is so profound because you see people wiping flies from the eyes of these babies and you see them dressing wounds from these infants who have exposed sores because they were given AIDS by their mother. And you know, that work is so, bleh. it's so meaningful. You know, it's just like the kind of work that I don't know who else steps forward to do it. So those volunteers you met, did they tell you why they were there? Oh yeah, they know very well. It's Christ's work. We, we love Christ. This is, this is what he'd want us to do. We're living in, in his vision, in his eyes, you know. The success of the Kink and World Vision pairing proved again, you don't have to agree on everything to work together to help others. And we brought the interviews back and the phone started ringing and by the end of the day, we had 800 people that had stepped forward and said, we'll do this. That's not bad for a heathen rock and roll stage. <laughs> well, we're still heathen, but you know, we do care about other people's needs. For lots of Americans, all they know about Christians, they get from TV. In Ethiopia, things are a little different. There are no satellites, there's no newspaper, there's no radio. I didn't see a single television set the entire time I was in any of these camps. And so when you ask them what they know about Americans, they know only World Vision. They know only of good work. They know only of benevolence. They know only of this great spirit of these people who have come to help them. So we've got pretty good PR going on there in terms of like, a, you know, a national foreign policy. I can get behind that. We can talk all day and argue all night and get nowhere. But the good news is, and I don't care what you believe or don't believe, loving kindness actually works. Every Friday night in Portland, under the Burnside Bridge in Old Town, Christians flood in from all over the state to meet the basic needs of the city's homeless. Night Strike has been going on for six years, but I didn't find it till I was ready to see. Uh, tonight we have about 70 volunteers from about 14, 10 to 14 different churches. Our focus is really to love people the way we think Jesus would love on people. These are the kind of places that we think Jesus would show up if you were here today. That's what Bridgetown does, it provides an opportunity, obviously, for the, the body of Christ to come be the church rather than just go to church on a Sunday. And then they find out they're not afraid of these people and these people are people that they normally lock their doors on. Now they're, now they're engaging in conversation. In addition to providing food, clothing, and toiletries, these volunteers offer something more valuable, respect and tenderness. It's one thing to stand in church mumbling the words to an old hymn, and it's another entirely to get down on your knees and wash the feet of a homeless person. I learned last week and I did a couple and it's just, um, people just love it. I myself was homeless for the last four years and um, more than food and everything, people crave hugs and touch. And um, the hardest part for me washing feet is that we have to use gloves. And especially people already when we're on the street, you feel like you're dirty and nobody wants to touch you. It really feels good. Have your feet washed, sides, hands, feet sides. Our old friend Tom Kratmaker took a break from writing his new book, Onward Christian Athlete, to visit Night Strike. One thing that was most inspiring to me was that they were not judging the moral worthiness 
of the homeless people they were helping. Going into it, they knew some of them were going to be drunk, some were high. Were they lazy? Is that why they were homeless? From that perspective of radical compassion, those questions are completely uh, irrelevant. We encourage the people here to not just come and serve them, but to get a bowl of food and actually sit down and eat with them, actually get to know their name. Um, we want people to know Jesus, obviously, but we're, we're really more, to be honest with you, we're really more interested that we get to know someone's name um, first and then let the conversation go where the conversation would go. Jesus hung out with the tax collectors. He's hung out with the zealots. He hung out with the prostitutes. That's what he did. Um, you know, regardless of where they're at in their life and, and what they've come up against, you can get down there and on your knees and wash their feet. And, and uh, I think that's probably what Jesus would do if he was here as well. If we followers of Jesus believe what we say we believe, this is a place where we get to prove it. There's a lot of people that can just come and, you know, go to church on Sunday, pay their $3, get their fill. But, you know, this is where the rubber hits the road. <laughs> when you are a Christian, if you if you're doing it because you just want the blessing, you're not gonna get blessed. <laughs> do you have the people that are like, you have to check the box because you do this, 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 and this, you're gonna go to hell for all these reasons. Not just sit and talk to a person and ask them how their day was. And so a lot of people are thrown by that, but it messes them up in definitely a good way. Definitely. But why do you think these people choose to come down to help out? If you were to, if you were to guess, you'd imagine. I think it's because they're Christian and they got Christ in them, you know? And that's what moves them to do what they do. Our friend Denise offered to wash my feet, and only then did I realize how difficult this is for both the giver and the receiver. It's a risk to be open to someone else, to be vulnerable, to accept a gift that you feel you don't deserve. If, if you know, like the Last Supper, the last thing Jesus did was wash all of his disciples' feet. How's that for symbolism? I think it's hard not to be inspired by witnessing something like that. And I think that if you want to talk about what is the best face of religion, the face of religion that is not divisive, but that brings people together and lifts us up, that's it. If this kind of outpouring of love can occur in the least religious state in America, then I have hope. So I guess it isn't the gospel of love that's dividing America. It's us, all of us, the Lord's followers and the rest of y'all. And we're going to have to decide how to treat each other even when we don't agree on the big issues. Because pastors are going to pray at inaugurations. Presidents will deliver commencement addresses. Beauty queens will share opinions. States will pass amendments. And comedians might even get elected to the Senate. But it's not a hopeless merry-go-round. After walking across America in this stupid suit, I'm actually encouraged. There are a lot of people in this country who know what they believe, why they believe it, and are willing to give of themselves for others. Save me from me. Save me.